Good morning, and welcome to Waterloo Baptist Church. We're glad you can join us in the convenience of your living room or your dining room or where it may be. Um, first of all, uh, let me uh, say this, that I know there's we're going through a tough time right now uh, with all some changes that's being made, and with the government continue to announce things going on, um, we want to heave, heave to what they are saying in relation to the distancing policy that they put into place. Um, basically trying to, trying to uh, stop the spread or limit the, the impact it may have on others. So with that said, I um, want to announce that or remind you that all activity or ministry at Wardle Baptist Church has been um, suspended with the exception of Wednesday night Bible um, prayer meeting. So that is still continuing and every other ministry is suspended at this time. So, um, again, sit back, relax in your living room, and enjoy our service. We're glad you're here, and welcome. And don't forget that uh, today is National Goof Off Day. So, what appropriate time for that. I mean, you can sit back in your home and goof off all day, or all week for that matter, because no matter businesses are reducing their workforce or suspended their workforce one way or the other they are. But um, we're here to praise the Lord and serve Him at the best capacity we can, and we're glad you're with us this morning. So we're going to start off with a um, little announcement as Marty will come up and make that. Good morning. Again, welcome to Waterloo Baptist Church. Um, this virus has got us all changing the way we do things. And first of all, we'd like to announce that this online message is just the beginning of our online, expanding our online footprint here at Waterloo Baptist Church. We now have online giving as well. We can't pass the plate through the internet. Um, but we do have an online giving button on our website, and we would encourage you to continue to give your tithes and offerings through the use of that button. Um, the church operations still cost money. The deacons fund, which helps people in need within our church family and in the greater community, will need money more than ever during this time of struggle. So we strongly encourage you to give. If you would still, if you're not comfortable giving online, please feel free to mail in a check. Um, the church address is on our website. We also want to announce we're still making preparations for Vacation Bible School. This year, our theme is Friends. Vacation Bible School is scheduled for July 5th through 9th. And there is a box on our donation, on our giving form for Vacation Bible School if you wish to designate money for Vacation Bible School. That said, I'd like to invite Pastor Guy back up to today's message. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. We're doing a series on Who Am I? And uh, right now we're, um, we've been doing uh, testimonies uh, each week. And so today's testimony will be from um, Nikki Guy. Good morning. 
Who am I? I'm Nikki Guy, um, and I recently joined Waterloo Baptist Church about three years ago. Um, but I want to step back and give you a little idea of what uh, my upbringing uh, was and how I became who I am today. Uh, as a young child, I grew up in a home where God was not a piece of our home. In fact, my father was very much against uh, the Bible. We didn't have a Bible in our home. Uh, we didn't pray in our home. In fact, my uncle on my mother's side of the family, he was a missionary. And most of my life I can remember my father being upset whenever my uncle would come to family events and would want to pray with the family. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really know God. Uh, in fact, I thought that Noah's Ark was uh, a fictitious story. I never realized that it was it was a true story of an event that actually occurred. Um, so another thing, my my dad would tell me as a young kid, and it really impressed upon me that the church only wanted our money. Um, and this a little bit later, my testimony will make a little bit more sense. But he told me that the church was no good. Um, all they wanted was money from people. Uh, so that really impressed upon me for a very long part of my life. Uh, so fast forward a little bit. When I was a freshman in high school, uh, my parents divorced. And at that time, uh, rightfully so, they were very much focused on themselves and trying to figure out who they were and who they were going to become uh, when they separated ways. And at that time, they, I felt that... I really wasn't a piece of their life, so I made the decision on my own at the age of 16 to move out. I was um, a junior in high school, and I was living on my own. Uh, I found myself entering into an extremely abusive relationship, both mentally and physically, to the point where I knew I needed help. Um, I was having suicidal thoughts. I knew that wasn't right, and I knew I needed help. And I didn't understand at the time, but God had been working in my life kind of behind the scenes. And he sent um, He sent my uncle, the missionary, up to New York. He lived in Pennsylvania at the time. And he took me to lunch. And that was the first time that I had ever heard the salvation message. And But he didn't exactly present it the way... Um, I would have expected, I guess, somebody to present it. He scared me. He told me, he asked me if I knew right now if I died, if I go to heaven. And I told him, well, I, I think so, because my mom has always told me I was a good person and I did good things, so I thought I would go to heaven. And he told me, no, that I would go to hell. And so he proceeded to give me the mess, salvation message, and he told me um, that my grandmother, who had recently passed away, a few days before she died, she had received Jesus into her heart and that he knew she was now in heaven. And shortly after she died, I had another uncle who had passed away. And literally a few hours before he passed away, he accepted Jesus into his life. So I was scared when he told me I needed to accept Jesus in my life because I thought, well, goodness, I'm not ready to die right now, so why would I accept Jesus into my life? Because I'm going to die. So he really scared me, and I didn't receive Jesus at that time, but he planted that seed. Um, so fast forward a little bit further in my life, and I met my now husband, Winston, who was a believer, and his mother was a strong believer as well. And she would pray for us. And she would tell us that she would pray for us. She prayed for us every day. And, again, I, I, I didn't really know the Lord at the time. And I thought she was just wasting her time. But it made her feel good. So I let her pray. And she was in her happy place. And um, then we got married. And we were, as the Bible would say, unequally yoked. Uh, my husband was saved. I was not saved. And my mother-in-law would continue to pray for us. And one day my husband approached me and said, you know, we really need to go to church. Um, we need to 
follow God. We need to find God. We need to be with God. So I said to him, it was Christmas Eve of 2000, the year of 2000. And we went to two different churches that day. We went to one in the morning. We went one to the evening. The evening service, um, I said, I told him, I said, I'll go to that church, but I'm not putting money in the plate because a church only wants my money. That's what my dad told me. And I'm not putting money in that plate because I'm just not going to give them money. That's not what I'm supposed to do. That's what my dad said. So the plate came around, but I now felt obligated because everybody in the church was giving money. So we put money in the in the plate, in the offering plate. And the usher took the money out of the plate, and he gave it back to me. And he said, we don't want your money. We're just glad that you came. And I was, like, blown away because he told me, completely opposite of what my father told me. So I looked at my husband. I said, we can come back to this church because they don't want our money. This is a good church. Um, And so from that point forward, we continued to go to church on every Sunday uh, to First Bible Baptist Church in Rochester. And we started to get a little bit involved. And I was learning more and more each day. And on August 26th of 2001, I got saved. Um, Actually, I got ahead of myself, so I want to go back a little bit into June of that same year. June 19th of that year, my mother-in-law passed away. And as I said, I had been going to church, and I had been learning about God's grace, and I had been learning about heaven. And I knew for the very first time uh, when my mother-in-law passed away, I had peace because I knew where she went. And it was the first time in my life that I'd ever encountered, that I've ever encountered somebody dying and having true peace in my heart because I knew where she was. That was June. August 26th of that same year, I got saved. Three days later... 9-11 9-11 occurred. And I can remember I worked at Bausch and Lomb at that time. And people were running around and people were crying and people were sad. And, and it was a very emotional day for everybody. It was tough. It was tough, tough times. But again, here's the second time in a couple of months that I had complete peace with what was going on. Because I knew God had a plan. And people at work, they were so angry with me. They were like, why are you not sad? You should be crying. You're you're heartless. And I said, I'm not heartless. God has a plan for this. This is all God's work. Um, And really from that day forward, God has blessed. He's blessed our marriage. Uh, We're going to be married for 22 years. And every single day. He has blessed our marriage. He's blessed my life in so many different ways. Um, so that's who I am. And I just want to leave um, with this quote out of Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Thank you. I mean, praise the Lord for the testimony. What a powerful one it is. As I said before, we're doing a series of Who Am I? And last week we started a series and was titled Who Am I? Identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ. Today's message, um, continuing that series, Who Am I? is entitled Our Identity as Christian. Or his identity as Christian. So I'm going to invite you this morning to turn to um, our text, which will be in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So grab a Bible and join me um, in Ephesians chapter 1. Before we do that, while you're searching for Ephesians, let me give you some staff um, for today. Did you know that from 266, from the 266 days from your conception to your birth, 
one single fossilized cell became a staggering complex organism organization of some two million cell. Did you know your growth rate as such that if, if you had continued to grow from birth at the same rate, then you would be 75 feet tall and weigh several ton by the age of 16. Did you know to view once code from just one cell, you would require watching five million frames of a TV. For it's one cell. Did you know each one of us had between 10 and 15 billion brain cells? Now, if each cell were a person, we would totally populate two planets the same size of Earth. Did you know your heart began to beat after about 21 days when you were only three millimeters long? Did you know your mother could hear, said you could hear your mother's um, voice after 16 weeks. And also, you had your own unique fingerprint at that time. I say that to say this, each of us is loved by God. Complex are maybe our design it shows how much God loves us. The Bible tells us that when you are in Christ, you are a new creature. All things are passed away, all things become new. When we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we become a Christian. We gain a new spiritual identity in Christ. So today our text is found in Ephesians chapter 1 and from verse 3 to 6. I would like you to, I would like to speak this morning on our identity as a Christian. So join me in as we read Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, by the way, Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 3 to 14 is the longest sentence in the New Testament. We don't see that in the English language version, but when you look at the Greek, the Greek doesn't use all the, the punctuation that the English does. All the Greek uses was a period. So and thus became Paul's longest speech without a, you know without taking a breath to say. Just to get his point across, he had to continue on that. So join me as we read in Ephesians chapter one, verse three. It says, Blessed be the God of our Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who had blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, according as He had chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory 
of his grace, wherein he had made us acceptable in the beloved. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise thee and give glory and honor to you. Thank you for your precious word that we have here this morning. Father, we do ask you a blessing on your word. May your word, Lord, in, just incite us. May your word inspire us. May your word move us to being obedient to your calling. To be obedient to your will. May we see how loving you are as a father which we have in heaven. Father, we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul shows us who we are in Christ and the kind of father we have in heaven. In doing so, he mentions four things about our identity as a Christian. And why we can look in God and say, God is my father. Why we can call God our father. As a Christian, we can call God our father because in verse 1, it said, Blessed be the God of our, be the God and father of Lord Jesus Christ. So number one, because we are blessed, we can call God our Father, blessed or happy. In verse 3 of our text, I would like you to notice three things that Paul mentioned concerning the blessing of God the Father. First, we see the source of our blessing. Paul says, blessed be the God of our Father, and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that, that word bless carries the idea of speaking well or, or, or of praising. Blessed mean prosperous or experience of hope and joy. Notice that the Holy Spirit put this phrase first to emphasize what God the Father has done for us. As children of God, our blessing comes from God the Father through Jesus Christ. That's the source. Second, we see the scope of our blessing. The scope of our blessing, is again, in the verse, it said again, Paul said, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Notice that word, who had blessed us. That's a present tense. It's not who will bless us, who's going to bless us. No, he already has blessed us with all spiritual blessing. Today we hear a lot about um, how uh, people are physically and or uh are mentally uh, rich and fame, you know, and and have a lot of money or whatever it may be. But let me tell you something. Because we have an an intimate relationship with Christ, we can enjoy the blessings He gives us now. We have to wait. You see, not long ago. Um, I think it was last year, we had a young man who was given one million dollars because he was able to make a basket from half court. One million dollars for shooting a hoop from a half court. Now, while it's unlikely that any of us will ever become a millionaire, as children of God, let me tell you something, we are wealthier than millionaires because we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing for the spirit, soul, and the body, for the past, for the present, and the future, and for salvation and service. 
God's spiritual blessings are far valuable than any material. Lastly, we can see the, the, the spare of our blessing. We see the, scope, the source, we see the scope, and now we see the spare. Paul tells us that the spare of our blessing is in the heaven places in Christ. You see, the unsaved person is primarily interested in earthly things, while the, the believer, the Christian's life, is more focused on the spiritual things, on heavenly things, things that will never pass away, never corrupt, never corroded, there is forever. God called us not only to appreciate, but also to appropriate what He gives us. We cannot live the Christian life without knowing what he have done with what we have in Christ it's like having a boat in a desert it's like having a car without fuel it's pointless it's useless we are spiritually billionaires so my friend I asked this morning why do we feel to live a life of such low expectation? We need to keep, we need to take that possession of what God provided for us. At the initial point of salvation, God gives us the, these blessings unconditionally. At the point of our belief in Christ, these blessings are eternal. And we need to take a hold of it. You know, throughout the, the, the book of Joshua, God told Joshua that he had given the land to Israel. Israel, all they needed to do was to claim that land, claim that blessing. Christians have the same to claim the blessing from God as well. You can be called, you can call God your father because you are blessed. You can call God your father because you are chosen. Look at me in verse 4. Verse 4, this is the second thing about our identity is found here in verse 4. Paul tells us that just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Notice that this verse says that our Father chose us. Our Father chose us. Paul said God had chosen us to emphasize this salvation depends totally on God. Not anything we've done. Not because we're lovely. Not because we're, we're, we're precious in our own eyes. Because of His love. The word chose, the word uh, chose is used in various ways in the Bible. Uh, if you look at, um, I think it was in, in Luke uh, six thirteen, Jesus chose the apostle. In, in the book of Acts chapter six five, the church chose the deacon, the seven deacons. It literally means to elect or to pick out of something. And in this reference, it means that God select us or chosen us as sinners for salvation and service. In John fifteen sixteen, it said this, said, He have not chosen me, 
Who's me? That's Jesus. But I have chosen you and, I, and ordained or appoint you that he should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever he shall ask in of the Father in my name he may give it to you. Jesus made the first choice to love and to die for us. To offer us eternal life. We make the next choice. To accept or reject this, that offer. His offer. Notice in this verse two things about God's choice. Two things that we notice about God's choice. Number one, notice first when Notice when he chose us. Paul said that it was was before the foundation of the world, before the cosmos, he chose us. In Matthew 25, 34, said, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, he who blessed by the Father, but my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from the foundation of the world. In Second Timothy chapter one verse nine, he said, "Who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace." which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God loved us, chose us, sent His his Son Christ to die for us. That's our love. Second, notice why. We see uh, when he chose us. You see, see why he chose us. Again, Paul said that we should be holy and blameless. Before him, God will never blame us for our sin. Why? Because Jesus paid for, for them by his blood. He's never going to look at you and, and, and he, as being blamed for our sin. In First Peter one fourteen, said as the beaten children, not fashioning ourselves according to the former loss in our in our ignorance, but as he which had called you is holy, so be he holy in all matter of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. No individual had a part in planning the concept of salvation. That was all God's prerogative. All His. God chose the kind of salvation He was to offer. We cannot create our own path, our own system of salvation. Why did God choose me? Why did He choose me? He chose you to demonstrate His character. He chose you that you may know Him and love Him. He chose you because He is love. He's gracious. He is merciful. He is, and He has a glorious plan for you and I. You can call God your Father because you're blessed. You can call God your Father because you're chosen. My friend, you can also call God the Father because you are adopted. We are adopted. The third thing that our identity is that our Heavenly Father 
has adopted us. In verse 5, looking at our text, in verse 5, Paul says, having predestinate or to know in advance us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You see, when the verse, when this verse is, it is important, when we read this verse, it's important to us to look back on the last two word in verse 4. The last two verses in verse 4 says, in love. In love. Paul tells us that in love, our Heavenly Father has adopted us. Basically, there are three things we need to understand about adoption. Three things. First, we need to understand the meaning of adoption. The meaning of adoption. The word adoption literally means the, the t- t- place of, the, the placing of us as son. Paul says he predestinate us as to the adoption of children. Now, predestinate, what does that mean? What does that word mean? It literally means to uh, to make to mark out uh, beforehand. This is another way of saying salvation is God's work and not our own doing. It's all God, all God. But when we talk about um, the adoption of children, keep in mind we are talking about infant here. We're talking about uh, grown children. Adoption has a dual meaning for the, the present and as well for the future. For the present, the present uh, application of our adoption has to do with the inheritance that we have before God the Father, before we are now His heir. We are now His heir. A little boy named Timmy was studying about his uh, his family heritage and looking through some family photos with his mother, they came across a picture of a very handsome young man. Who's that? Little Tommy asked. That's your that's your father, replied the mother. Now, I'm sure proudly. Oh yeah, Tommy asked. Um, said kind of uh, doubtfully. She said, "He said, well then, who is that old bald-headed man that lives with us now?" My friend, Galatians chapter four. Verse 4 says, But when, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made or born of a woman, made or born under the law, to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because He are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more servant or slaves, but a son. And if a son, then heir of God through Christ. In Romans 8.15, it said, For ye are not, have not received a spirit of bondage or slavery again to fear, but he have received a spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness 
to our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of the fathers of God, and joint heir, heir with Christ. If so, that we suffer with him, that we may also glorify together. That's the present. That's the present. The future application of adoption refers to a, a, a glorified body we are going to receive when Christ returns. In Romans 8. Verse 18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for, waiteth for the, the manifestation of the Son of God. For the creature has made subject to vanity, not willing, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into a glorious liberty of the children of God. For we now that the whole Know that the whole gro creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And now, and not only they, but ourself also, which have the fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit. The redemption of our body. My friend, we have the fruit, the first fruit, the first installment, the first down payment of the Holy Spirit. We have that. We have that. And we ought to glorify for that. We ought to praise God for that. The second, all we notice is that the means of it, the means by which we are adopted. Paul tells us that this was accomplished through Jesus Christ himself, to himself. My friend, if it were not for the death, for the burial, for the uh, resurrection of Jesus, we would never have been adopted. Third, notice the motive for adoption. See, the means, notice the motive for adoption, for our adoption. He said, we are told that it was according to the good pleasure of His will. We were not Adopted by God because of some goodness that He found within us. But rather, it was because of His love for us, for each one of us. This leads us to the last thing about who we are in Christ and the kind of Father we have in heaven. You can call God your Father because we're blessed. You can call God your Father because we're chosen. You can call God your Father because you're adopted. And fourth, you can call God your Father because you are accepted. You were accepted. Look in verse 6. In verse 6, we find... The, the find that our Heavenly Father has also adopted us. Paul said that to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He had made us adopted in the Beloved. When we consider all the things that God has done for us, we find that 
Everything is based upon His grace. His grace. Which He freely bestows upon us. He freely gives us. That's free. God's grace is His unmerited favor towards us. Grace is God not giving us what we deserve. What we deserve is His judgment because of our sin. Instead of judgment, God gives us grace. John 1, 16 says, And of His fullness we have received, all receive, and grace for grace. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And 1 Corinthians 15, 10 said, But by grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace, which was blessed, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Let me conclude with this. A businessman who commuted to work um, by a ferry boat noticed a young man, a young passenger, um, one day, uh, a youngster, with a shoe shine kit. The man spoke kindly to the to him and paid him to shine his, the shoes. From the day, from that day on, whenever the businessman aboard uh, come aboard that boat, the boy would always approach him with a happy smile. He would offer to carry his briefcase to brush off his clothes, and without expecting any kind of reward, after a few uh, a week or two, the man asked the young the young lad as to what made him so attentive. He said, Sir, he replied, the first time you met me, you called me my boy. Till then, I didn't belong to anyone because my parents are dead. But you are so kind and you always call me your boy there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Needless to say, the businessman was so deeply touched. Soon he made arrangement to see that the young lad, the young fellow, would be well taken care of. Since the man was a Christian, this experience brought him to mind the scripture that read and I will be a father unto you and he shall be my son and daughters the second Corinthians 618 he thought how blessed it is that Christ in his love had told us that we as believers are not orphans in this this storm of life. For we are, we have a Father who loves us. Who loves us. My friend, we can I know we are a Christian. 
identify the Christian because why? Because we are uh, blessed, we are chosen, we are adopted, we are accepted. These are what Christ has done for us. My friend, we are blessed in Christ. Our identity is that as a Christian, we are blessed in Christ. Our identity is that we are blessed, we are chosen in Christ. We are adopted in Christ. We are accepted in Christ. The reason God gives us a perfect status before Him was because He loved us. When God looks at us, all He sees is Jesus in us. Everything else, everything that He represents, He saw in us. My question to you this morning is, when God look at you, what does he see? What does he see? If you're not a Christian, then he doesn't see you. He doesn't see Jesus in you. But if you're a Christian this morning, when God looks at you, all he sees is Christ. So let's act just that way. That we are all these things in Christ. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, praise you, glorify you for the wonderful things that you've done for them, for the marvelous things you have, you have done for us. For your son Jesus Christ. Who died and shed his blood for us. That we may know you. And Lord I pray. That as we. Absorb. These truths. As we absorb them. We can reflect. What we know. About you to others. We can be the beacon of hope to those that doesn't have a hope. We can leave. We can be the lending hand to those that are unable to get up. May we be that blessed hope. May we be that bridge to bring others to you. Bless us today as we go this morning. Guide and protect us, Lord, as we go through this tough time, this tough season of uncertainties. Not so long this this epidemic will last, but we know with you, your goodness is always, is forever, is eternal. Bless us as we go. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen.